Good evening, Mocha friends. My name is Neil Wu Gibbs, Director of Programs and Chief of Staff at the Museum of Chinese in America. It is my pleasure to welcome you to all these special conversations with Clarissa Wei, an acclaimed Taipei-based food journalist and author of Made in Taiwan, Recipes and Stories from the Island Nation. This event will illustrate the rich tapestry of Taiwanese cuisine and bring Taiwan's distinct culinary identity to the forefront. Through over 100 meticulously crafted recipes and insightful essays, Wei's narrative weaves together personal stories and professional expertise, offering a comprehensive look at modern Taiwanese cuisine through the lens of those who know their best, the people of Taiwan. The conversation will be moderated by Kim Lam Ko, author of the award-winning cookbook, Phoenix Clouds and Jay Trees, Essential Techniques of Authentic Chinese Cooking. During the program, Wei and Ko will also showcase a cooking demonstration of garlic sliced pork, Suan Yi Bai Rou. We also encourage you to submit questions anytime during the discussion for the Q&A. This event is also being recorded for on-demand viewing on Mocha's YouTube channel. If you enjoy tonight's program, please consider supporting Mocha. Your generosity is vital to our institution and helps us create future programs that inspire and uplift diverse communities. You may also donate on our website at mockanyc.org. If you would like to purchase a copy of Made in Taiwan, please check on Clarissa's website at clarissaway.com slash made in Taiwan. We look forward to sharing this evening with you, filled with engaging stories, culinary inspiration, and a deeper appreciation for the unique flavors of Taiwan. Prepare to be transported through Taiwan's diverse food scene. Without further ado, I will hand it over to Kim to start the conversation. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Neil. Uh, and thank you everybody for joining us tonight or this morning over at Clarissa's uh, location. Clarissa is actually uh, zooming in from Taipei and uh, it is about what, a uh, quarter of eight now in, in Taipei in the morning, I think. So yes. anyway, we're really excited for, we're really excited for this conversation with Clarissa. And I am, uh, you know, really, uh, uh, I, I appreciated that, that, that Clarissa got up early this morning to come and talk to us. So anyway, um, just to uh, Clarissa, uh, tell us a little bit about your background, just, you know, um, uh, where you're from and your, uh, how you were born in, in L.A., right? You were born in California, right? And then how did you make uh, your, uh, your, 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 your journey through uh, all this in America and then back to Taiwan again? Yeah, um, so I was born and raised in Los Angeles um, to Taiwanese immigrants. And I just think um, I grew up eating a lot of Taiwanese food. I was born in the San Fernando Valley and my parents would drive to the San Gabriel Valley, which is a very Taiwanese part of Los Angeles. They would drive for an hour every single week to go to 99 Ranch to stock up on, on groceries and eat at restaurants. Um, and in college, I was a journalism major at NYU. And um, initially, I thought they wanted to do politics, but it just felt really um, heavy and intense, and I just did not find joy in it, and for some reason, I just started gravitating towards food. Um, my starting point was when I was studying abroad in Shanghai, and I started writing about Western restaurants in China for CNN, and this was at a time where there weren't as many Western restaurants as there are um, now in Shanghai. Um, and when I moved back to New York, and I think that's where um, you and I met, Ken. Um, yes, I, we met. Yeah, I was writing about um, restaurant openings for the Village of Voice. And then I, because I can speak Chinese, I started writing about Chinese restaurants, Taiwanese restaurants, mm -hmm. that just snowballed um, into me sort of being, you know, like a Chinese food voice or authority. Um, but it was a very niche thing. And after a while, I was like, what am I doing here in America? If I really want to understand Asian cookery, Asian food, I could really be in Asia. So I spent um, about a year backpacking through Taiwan and China. Um, and next thing I knew, I accepted a job at the South China Morning Post where my job is literally to fly to China every single month and shoot videos on food and culture. And it was such a dream job. Um, and then a 
couple of things happened. The pandemic hit, um, the Hong Kong protests happened. I got married and my husband and I decided to move to Taiwan and we've been here ever since. And it's interesting how all of that has happened. That's, has that's an that. amazing journey. That's an amazing yeah. journey. For, so, uh, you know, it's like, uh, uh, so what an, what accomplishments that you've done so for all these uh, two decades that you were working it's like a, really amazing um so how did you decide that you're going to uh, write a taiwanese cookbook yeah so i think growing up taiwanese in america i've always felt that the conversation was very limited when people think of taiwanese food in america they only have a couple of dishes um in their head and that's like beef noodle soup um there's um, maybe you get like the pork chop, um, the fried chicken cutlet, like boba, um, guam ball, especially for people in New York. But I didn't feel like that really represented my conception of Taiwanese food. My parents are from Tainan in the South, which is like the food capital of Taiwan. And a lot of the dishes right. I grew up eating, like muan kue, which is the steamed rice pudding or oladen, this um, oyster omelet you never saw that in America. So it was just compounded frustration and built up inside of me over many years. And I thought, you know, I'm moving to Taiwan. I'm a food writer. Um, Taiwan is constantly in the news these days because of geopolitics. Now is a really good right. time to tell that story. Good. So um, t t we're going to uh, uh, show, uh, show the audience a little uh, uh, to make one particular dish. Um, so how did you uh, decide to pick this particular dish? Yeah, Is so this a representative of a Taiwanese uh, food? Yeah, so this dish that we're making um, is suan basil or garlic sliced pork. And this is a dish you see, you know, all throughout East Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, it's garlic sliced pork. Um, and it's something you see at our Zetal restaurants or our beer restaurants. Um, and I picked this dish because it's easy to demo. Uh, on camera, but also I think it embodies a lot of things. Um, so we have a, a pork belly. Um, we both boiled it ahead of time, and it's really right. simple. Basically, take a raw slab of pork belly, about a pound. Um, you put it in um, cold water to start with, um, and then you put aromatic, sorry, ginger, scallion. You turn that right. up, the lid on, um, and have it come to a rolling boil. And then once right. it comes to a rolling boil, you lower the heat and have it simmer for five minutes. And then you just turn the heat off and that residual heat will cook the pork until it's tender. So it's very like hands off. And I think I really like how this, this dish because it, is, it kind of embodies a lot of um, principles of how Taiwanese food, Taiwanese people think of texture. So because it's just boiled um, pork or poached pork, right. the fat is not rendered out. And so you still have like the skin and the fat attached and it's very like QQ, which is what we call in Taiwan as springy and um, right, right. If you will. And I think for people who are not accustomed to Asian cuisine, this isn't a texture necessarily for everyone, but it's something that's very prized um, right. in Chinese, Taiwanese cookery. Um, and what gives us the unique Taiwanese touch really is the condiments we put on it. Um, and yeah. we'll talk about this. So in Taiwan, we have a condiment that's special to the island called soy paste. Um, this is Jinglan, uh, Jiang Yong Gao soy paste. Um, and it's mm -hmm. really just thickened soy sauce with sugar. This is the northern variation. So we'll put licorice in it. Um, but you can, so when I make my sauce with this, I dilute it with sugar and water because this is really, really um, salty. But you can also just buy pre-bought, um, pre pre-made soy paste. So this um, is from Udingxing. Um, in New York, a, a boutique shop called Yunhai, and they sell it. And this, I think, is already balanced out. Um, and so in the restaurants in Taiwan, like that brown sauce you see on everything, on danbing, um, on scallion pancakes, um, that's the, the soy paste is kind of the foundation of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wanted to showcase Taiwanese comments. So actually, this is this is an interesting ingredient because um, you know I I grew up in uh, Southeast Asia, and uh, in Indonesia there is uh, the ketchup manis, uh, which is also a sweet soy sauce paste, and um, you know I've compared the flavor; they are actually very similar. And mm -hmm. um, the thing about the the ketchup manis is a bit sweeter than the 
Zhang Yu Gao from Taiwan. Uh, but otherwise, it's a, it, I think it's a similar concept. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I'm I'm wondering if if these are not related because there are so many uh, people from uh, in the south, you know, southeastern China that immigrated out to Singapore, like the Fujian people, the uh, the Kejia uh, Hakka people. They um, I, and and they, especially Fujian, use a lot of Jiang Yu Gao. So I was wondering if that sort of like got transmitted to to Southeast Asia. You think? Uh, yeah, so when I was doing research on the history of Zhang Yogal, again, it's hard to find out any food history because a lot of this was written down, so it's just a lot of like right. myths. And so writing my book was trying to sort through all of that. So I called up the this company, Jinglan, which is the largest Jinglan. Um, mm -hmm. in Taiwan. And they said um, it was there was a vendor in Danzui, which is northern Taipei, and they were selling fish balls, and then they wanted like a thick um, soy sauce to coat the fish bowl to serve mm -hmm. to their customers and that's how this came about but again like I think um, like a thickened soy sauce paste this is you see it all throughout Asia um, in Hong right, Kong right it is it is sauce, yeah, right? and also in Thailand I think they use they use the uh, this thickened soy sauce as well in Thailand yeah, yeah. Uh, the benefit of it is it just adds another dimension. So when you're doing braises, you don't just put soy sauce. You'll put soy sauce mm -hmm. and, you know, the soy paste. Um, and it just adds texture and um, a deeper flavor. But people love this. And actually, the more south you travel in Taiwan, the sweeter it gets. So um, something... <laughs> oh, the sweeter it is, the sweeter it gets? Yeah. Um, and the so lighter it gets, too. So you can uh, actually... Oh, uh, okay. It. This brand is kind of in central Taiwan, so it, the light is kind of bad, but like this is from Taipei. This is darker uh -huh. and sweeter. This is already a little bit more brown and sweeter. And if you go uh -huh. even more to Tainan, where my family is from, it is so sweet and it's um, a very light brown. So it changes depending on where you are in Taiwan. Great. That's amazing. So I'm actually going to cook with you along. Uh, I'm going to make this list along with you. We can, we can, uh, <laughs> we can, uh, I guess, uh, get started, right? So, yeah. um, so the first thing is what well, we I've I've already pre cooked the the pork belly, and and you mentioned that you've already pre cooked the pork belly as well. So shall we go ahead and slice them? Yeah, let's slice it. Um, okay. And pigs are branded, which is why there's this pink thing. And you actually can see that in my cookbook too. If you look at the edges of the fat, you'll see like a pink thing. Um, but that's it's edible and that's very normal. Actually, you know, that's the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about because Americans are so scared of like, you know, pink uh, center in meat, uh, yeah. you know, especially for pork and chicken. So um, I think it's it's interesting that how you know we we uh, in Chinese or in Asian cooking, um, we always try to to um, make it almost uh, just barely cooked so that, so that the, the meat will be very tender, right? Yeah, and that's why this recipe um, it uses the residual heat to cook it. You don't want an overcooked pork belly because that is just right. not very good. Right. And then um, the skin is optional, but again, in Taiwan and Asia, people leave the skin on. Um, right. Really, mostly what we're doing is plating today. <laughs> So actually, I I cook the the pork the way you um, suggested in the recipe, which is to turn off the heat and let it cook by the residual heat. And mm -hmm. I have to admit that the, the the meat came out beautiful. Oh, awesome! Yeah. yeah. So yeah, this it, is it really look like I can't take credit for all of this. Um, my recipe developer Ivy was the one mm -hmm. who you know taught me these techniques and really gave the book the foundation. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, thanks to her, I learned this because I think I would, so, if you look at it, tell, online, us, a little, yeah, uh, tell us a little bit about Ivy, um, you yeah. know, uh, how, how is your collaboration and all that? Um, so Ivy has been teaching uh, Taiwanese cuisine for 20 some years now. Um, and I just knew when I um, did this book that I wanted a perspective of someone who's been doing this for a lot longer than me. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I grew up in America, and so my perspective is still very American. And I mm -hmm. really, I, she helped me ground my techniques into what people do here. Um, so like certain things like cooking the pork with the residual heat, I probably would not 
have known. Mm -hmm. And she was just someone I could ask questions um, whenever I was confused about, you know, um, when I was trying to figure out what the Taiwanese pantry was, I just went to her kitchen and looked at all of it. And I was like, oh, right. this makes sense. And I think that's important when you're doing a book about a culture, right. even if it's one culture, um, things changed a lot over the generations. So the Taiwanese food, the Taiwanese kitchen that my parents grew up with is very different um, than the Taiwanese kitchen today here in Taiwan. True, true. Yeah. You better so, so I'm going to arrange this the way that your photo showed. <laughs> yeah, so you can arrange this however, however you want. There's no because um, that's that's really beautiful. So I'm going to just go ahead and and do it yeah, just the way yeah. you your 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 picture does it. So um yeah um so you're talking you know you mentioned the, the the texture because of the fat that's not completely rendered. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any pr uh, any problem with with like uh, people that you deal with, like who are Westerners, who who end up um, looking at this and say, "Oh, it's all this fat." Do you have any 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 like um, pushback from people? Uh, no, because I market this book is supposed to be a snapshot of what food is in Taiwan today. It's not. Mm -hmm. you know, um, Taiwanese food diluted perhaps for the American crowd and I think because it um is marketed like that I actually haven't gotten that sort of um pushback and it is incredible that in 2024 we're finally able to do cookbooks where the food is again representative of what the food right. is in Asia today because I don't think I would have been able to do this 10 years ago 10 years um, ago right right yeah the only interesting thing about recipe development was that when, uh, so we had over 50 recipe testers in the Western world, and with that I mean Europe and the United States, test the recipes, and a lot of the feedback was, oh, it needs to be saltier, but like honestly, mm. it is not salty. So it was me and Ivy trying to balance Western preferences with what it actually tastes like here in Taiwan, and uh -huh. that was really difficult because, yeah, the joke is, Taiwanese food, we don't use finishing salt um, on things. It's pretty mild. Um, uh -huh. And that was kind of difficult to balance. So um, oh, again, okay. the book, add as much salt as you want, but people here really don't add salt, much salt on anything. <laughs> so that, that was, that was the, the main comment then from people about, about the recipes in the book, that it wasn't seasoned yeah, enough. It wasn't salty enough. But it's interesting, if you go to um, Taiwanese restaurants in the States, my mom will always be like, oh, it's too salty. Like, it has too much punch to it. It's <laughs> funny, um, it's very, very mild. Uh-huh. So, okay, I mean, since we're, 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 we're in the, on the subject of, of, like, Taiwanese food, right? Uh, uh, what are the iconic dishes that you, you, uh, uh, that you would say truly represent Taiwanese cooking? Uh, what other iconic dishes? Um, so I think the oyster omelet is a really good one. Um, mm, mm -hmm. sweet Ooh, I, which I love. I love uh, oyster omelet. Yeah, I have sweet potato starch. Um, I'm going to start on the cucumbers. Sweet potato starch, um, egg, and coin-sized oysters. And on top, again, is like a sweet chili sauce, which is very mm -hmm. local in Taiwan. Um, right, right. What else? Um, anything rice based. So I have a whole section on a thing called kue. You guys have that in Singapore too, as well, right? It's right, called, right. Yes, um, yes. Okay. And these used to be pastries that were offered to the ancestors or the gods. Um, mm -hmm. So that I think is very iconic. And then the one I think everyone associates Taiwan with beef noodle soup, but I would argue that a braised pork belly over rice is more. Mm commonly eaten here in Taiwan because that braised pork, they'll put it over everything. They'll put it over stir fried vegetables. Um, they'll put it over noodles. Um, and it's really simple too. It's just soy paste, soy sauce, and garlic, sh and shallots, and a lot mm -hmm. of sugar, um, braised for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. And you get that um, buttery pork belly. So you also talk about how 
Taiwan food really is a, um, uh, you know, a, a combination of all these different influences over the years. Um, and do you think that, you know, uh, the Taiwanese people actually take what is from, like say imported from China or imported from, uh, uh, you know, Southeast Asia and then make it them their own? I mean, do they then put in a twist to make it the Taiwan's own? No, so what happens is that uh, we've had different waves of immigration. It's very similar to America, if you will, like the different waves of immigration. So when I was in LA, what I really focused on was like the different Chinese speaking immigrants in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So for example, like 18th century, 19th century Chinese food was very different than Chinese food in America today. Back then it was like chop suey. And then mm -hmm. and then you have uh, American Chinese food, like orange chicken, general salad chicken. And today, now you have mainland Chinese immigrants coming in and creating amazing food. So you have Sichuanese restaurants that taste exactly what it does, um, that taste exactly how it tastes in Sichuan. So similar with Taiwan, our first immigrants came from China in the 18th century. And so they brought over food similar to what they have in Fujian. Um, but again, right. that was two centuries ago to two, three centuries ago. That was around the time the United States of America was founded. And so it's really right. interesting when people again conflate uh, the two cuisines. And then after that, um, the Japanese came and they monopolized all our core cuisine. So the way that our soy sauce is made is made with Japanese style recipes. Um, mm. And then, interestingly enough, after World War II, the Cold War really ushered in this love for American flavors um, because America gave Taiwan billions of dollars of um, aid. Um, mm -hmm. And that really, okay, I'm so bad at multitasking. I'll just focus on talking. <laughs> that really shepherded in this love for American cuisine. So we have um, hamburgers for breakfast, we have night market steaks. Um, we have a lot of wheat dishes because America just flooded Taiwan with wheat. Um, mm. so again, all of these influences and something that's new that I didn't put in my book because again, it's so new is that we actually have a lot of Southeast Asian immigrants over who marry Taiwanese people and then they naturalize. And so mm -hmm. now we have Southeast Asian dishes and they have over the years um, become Taiwanese. Another big wave right. and significant wave was um, in 1945 with the nationalist government um, during right. the war. Um, right. 10 million refugees, I forgot the exact number. They came from China to Taiwan and they brought with them regional Chinese cuisine. And this right, is right, right. perception of Taiwanese food is stuck in time. I meet people um, of my parents' generation who haven't been to Taiwan in 30 years. They'll be like, oh my gosh, Taipei has such great regional Chinese food. Um, that was true. 50 years ago. That's not true today. Um, I think we right, were joking right. before how when I go to LA, I go to Chinese restaurants because I can't really find like good Sichuanese food here or good Cantonese food here really anymore. Not to the same standard um, as it was um, back then. And so with mm -hmm. these immigration patterns, with the generations, the food evolves to become uniquely Taiwanese. And mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. this is the perfect example, right? This dish um, is something that's very common in Sichuan. Um, but then over the years, you know, they put soy paste on. We put our own unique condiments. Um, right. It, again, just becomes uniquely Taiwanese. Right. Uh, so yeah, sorry, that was a big history lesson. <laughs> oh, no. No, I think that's a, that's a really great um, explanation of how Taiwanese food just sort of evolved over the years and and really um, embraced its own identity eventually and and combined with all sorts of all sorts of other influences and everything. So so yeah, I think that that's one of the one of the um, beauty of Taiwanese food is that it it, it really uh, uh, absorb different uh, regional cooking in China and. And cooking from different uh, foreign influences, and also uh, you know Southeast Asia. So yeah, I think that's that's an amazing um, uh, combination. Yeah, so, and I use 
Singapore and kind of Malaysia as an example too. I mean, these are countries also with immigrants from all over and different waves of immigration. And so even though Singaporean cuisine has a lot of Chinese influences, um, it is also Singaporean cuisine, correct? And right, right, right. right. We China, Chinese culture is such an important and big part of what it means to be Taiwanese, but it's not the only thing that defines us. And I think that that nuance is something beautiful and something to be celebrated. Right. And not alienating people, which is what I think happens a lot, right. especially in the online space. Speaking of that, I, I noticed that, you know, in a lot of your writing, you are embracing the Taiwan identity. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. How do you, how do you feel about uh, being Taiwanese as opposed to, uh, quote unquote, Chinese? Uh, how did you, uh, you know, uh, evolve to uh, embrace that particular identity? Yeah, so I was raised by very apolitical parents who don't care about identity and politics. Um, and growing up in LA um, in the 90s, everyone from Taiwan and Hong Kong and China, we just all kind of referred to ourselves as Chinese. And a lot of this has to do with my parents' upbringing. They were raised during martial law here in Taiwan, where people here were told that they were going to be returned to the fatherland. Um, it right. Was you know, a very, it was a dictatorship um, back in the day. And then right. in the 2000s, Taiwan transitioned to a democracy. Now, my parents and the wave of Taiwanese people who moved away from Taiwan, they weren't here for that. Um, and so, and I wasn't here for that either. And it wasn't really until I started coming to Taiwan as an adult and meeting Taiwanese people of my similar age until I really realized, oh, wow, there's a new sense of Taiwanese identity. People identify Taiwanese as being um, separate. Obviously, this movement has been around um, way before the 2000s, um, but now it's really become mainstream and embraced by even our current government. And again, I think the conversation around what it means to be Taiwanese in the outside world, outside of Taiwan, is still very much stuck in the 90s and 80s. Even, and it's not that people are wrong per se, they're just not updated on the latest. And as, mm -hmm. as a food writer, I really just wanted to show people how the people in Taiwan see themselves and see their cuisine. And it's not just this one monolithic idea either. And you know, in my cookbook, I interview um, war veterans from China who identify as both Chinese and Taiwanese because they were born in China and they came here um, and they eat, you know, lots of scallion pancakes and dumplings. And, and but then interestingly enough, their children only identify it as Taiwanese. So identity is a very nuanced thing. Um, but again, it's something I think this nuance is to be um, celebrated and we are not just this one thing. Right. right. No, I think that's really important to to uh, be able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, respect your own culture, but yet at, this, uh, at the same time come up with your own identity. And I think that's, that's a, a, you know, culinary wise or, or politically or otherwise. Um, but I think it's, uh, of, of course, culinary wise, it's a, it's a very important part of, of that uh, identity. So yeah, I mean, this, it's, it's, it's really great that somebody is actually taking time to explain to people, you know, how, this identity is so important. Um, so let's people address in, this. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I said people here in Taiwan don't necessarily understand what makes Taiwanese cuisine unique. And this is something I had to figure out with my book research. Um, before mm -hmm. I was Googling all these Taiwanese recipes and they were like, oh, use dark and light soy sauce, Shaoxing wine. And I was like, yeah, of course, that makes sense. And then I came here and I went to the grocery stores. I went to Ivy's Kitchen. I was like, wait, you guys don't really use light or dark soy sauce. And Shaoxing wine is like imported in from China. That's not something that's typical either. We use Micho, which is like more right. similar to bean sake. We really right. only have one type of soy sauce. And that mm -hmm. was a big moment in my research where I realized, oh, our pantry is unique to Taiwan. But the reason why people kind of get muddled is when uh, 
families like my own family, when they move to America, they just make the dishes based on what they have. Um, and a lot of what's available is, again, this hodgepodge of um, Asian ingredients from all over Asia. Right. So and you here. said in your in your interview with people, they don't think of it as being a Taiwanese cuisine. What do they think of the food? And do they have, I mean, do they consider it as being like a Chinese or, or what? No, what I mean is people here don't intellectualize it as much as we do in America. Uh -huh. Because we are uh -huh. a technically homogenous society. You're never right. trying to really think about what defines your food or what makes your food unique because again, it's just we're here in Taiwan. I think it's a um something special to America where in America it's all of these melting pots of different cultures and people are really trying to figure out what it means to be Taiwanese or Chinese and figure out your roots. But again, people don't intellectualize that as much here in Taiwan compared to the States. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Great. So it's um, very hard to compare it to, too. It's not like you have a next door neighbor who came from China. Immigration from China has been closed for many, many years. Um, I don't meet anyone from China. It's, I, we're all, um, we have more similarities, so you don't have anything to compare it to. Right, right. Um, okay, uh, well, now that we've finished this uh, beautiful uh, uh, plate, should we dress this? Yeah, so it's just the sauce. It's really easy. Um, you make the soy paste yourself. So again, it's like this mm -hmm. thick soy sauce. And if you don't mm -hmm. have this at home, you can just um, have soy sauce. It's in the book too, soy sauce, sugar, water, and um, thicken it with sweet potato starch. Mm -hmm. uh, so I also have... Um, a uh, soy sauce paste, uh, soy sauce here. So we're gonna yeah. put some garlic in it. Garlic, yeah. Um, people love garlic here. This is suan yi bai lo, and the suan is suan tou, which is garlic. Uh, so garlic right. is crucial. Um, and then you just add a little, you just add a little bit of sesame oil and chili. Mm -hmm. The chili is so I just, I just put in because I know. I just, Chickens, like chili crisp is having a moment that people in Taiwan don't like spicy stuff at all. So um, <laughs> those restaurants don't actually put that. A little bit of sesame right, so, oil. So I just put some sesame oil and I'm going to put some chili because I like spicy food. <laughs> yeah, I like spicy food too. Um, <laughs> yeah, Taiwan is, people are really scared of spice. Uh, but ironically, we have the largest chili pepper collection in the world in a center called the World Vegetable Center. Um, really? It's, yeah, it's wow. just a center that was established um, during martial law. And it's an international vegetable research center. So we have the largest, it's like the um, seed collection. So they have the largest collection of like mung beans, tomatoes, and chili peppers. And I went wow. to the seed center and I was like, what is all of this? Why are all, all why is this? <laughs> peppers and when I was interviewing the local staff they were like oh Thai lala like I can't eat it it's too much <laughs> <laughs> mm. okay so we're just going to pour this yeah uh, you dress it and that's it it's very very simple you can make this ahead of time wow this looks so good yeah I'm my mouth is watering. <laughs> it's the garlic. It is. It's the garlic. <laughs> okay, this is so, garlic. and then you said that you can um, garnish with more garlic. You can garnish with more garlic. Yeah. Um, we love raw garlic here in Taiwan. If you go to the night markets and you order a Taiwanese sausage, they give you like a uh -huh. of raw garlic on top. It's not for everything. <laughs> we love it here. And yeah. That's that's it. So yours is prettier. This looks wonderful. So I'm yeah. I'm gonna zoom into yours. I wanna see it. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, I guess that's <laughs> <laughs> that's it. It looks really uh, is uh, I'm gonna I'm going to taste a piece, okay? <laughs> mm. This looks so good.
Yep. Mmm. Yeah. And the skin should be chewy. Ooh, I put a little bit too much garlic mm. on that. You're right. The pork is cute. Yeah. It's really delicious. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about Q. I mean, that's like, <laughs> it's uniquely, um, well, not just Taiwanese, but even the um, Fujian people also uh, use the term Q. But um, what is it? What is it? <laughs> yeah, so Q means, um, it's, some, it's often mistranslated as al dente. Um, ooh, let me have some coffee. Um, but to me, it means more like bouncy and elastic. So when I was, um, I went to a gongwan vendor. Gongwan is like a meatball right. vendor. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. They said, oh, the sign of a very cute meatball is when you can bounce it and it like hits you back on the head. And they showed me this YouTube video. I'm not kidding. Of someone like playing ping pong with their like meatballs. <laughs> Again, in the Western world, that's like horrific, right? Like you would never want your meatballs to bounce and hit people. Bounce like that, but, right? Uh, that's very cute. That's um, a good texture. So it's right. definitely cultural nuance here. Um, and you see it all over Taiwan. They actually use the English letter Q and then Q, Q yeah. extra Q. Um, yeah, it's just a term right. that, that it's all dente in it. Yeah, because I don't think there is. I don't think there is a Chinese character for Q. There is in Taiwanese. It's in my book. And it was something that oh, okay. the Japanese, like um, wrote down. So it's in the Hokkien language. Um, oh, okay. Can, not in the Mandarin language. But yeah, it's not in like Mandarin Chinese. But if you like search hard enough and like it's a Taiwanese character, but that's not on the Chinese keyboard. It's very difficult to find. I had the hardest mm. time getting printed in my book because most fonts don't have that character. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So anyway, there's more um, in terms of uh, Taiwanese cooking than just this Chinese influence. Uh, you know, in, the, in your book, you actually wrote about uh, the indigenous people food. Yeah. So um, uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So the um, indigenous people, Austronesians, they've been here for thousands of years. And Culinary wise, their food is more similar to um, like Polynesia and the Philippines. So the Austronesians, there's this out of Taiwan theory that um, the original Polynesians came out of Taiwan and then they spread throughout Southeast Asia. So to the Philippines and also throughout Oceania. So eventually, you know, to Hawaii, um, to New Zealand. And you right. see okay. similarities in the language. So my friend, Alice, who's in the book, um, there are Filipino people who come to Taiwan and they speak Tagalog and she's like, oh, I can kind of understand those words. And they, at the same time, they're like, oh, I can kind of understand what she's saying. So there are similarities in the, the language, but there's also similarities in the cuisine as well. So a lot of taro, um, a lot of root vegetables. And also um, I always tell people it's hard to define what indigenous Taiwanese food is because it's very localized. So Alice like lived her tribe lived in a mountain range in um, southern Taiwan. So she never, their tribe never touched the ocean. They never went to the ocean, but they're mm. really cultures. And so for salt, they use um, a sumac tree, like the sea, dried seeds of a sumac tree that was kind of salty and they would dry that. Whereas like the ocean, wow. the Amis, they, you know, never went to the mountains and they were really good at fishing and, you know, harvesting sea salt. So it's people always ask me to like define indigenous Taiwanese cuisine in a couple of sentences and I'm like it's literally impossible because these tribes they were their own separate nations and most of them didn't really interact with each other all that much um there are 16 recognized tribes in Taiwan but those that categorization was given to them by the Japanese empire and um those categorizations just mean they share a similar linguistic group so the Amis, they're not one tribe. There are a dozen little tribes within the Amis. And mm. again, they necessarily meet with each other. And um, you can't really find indigenous Taiwanese food in Taipei because their ingredients are very, again, localized. You can't grow them en masse and um, ship them <laughs> internationally. But if you go to the east coast of Taiwan and you travel down there, 
there are a lot of restaurants um, and a lot of producers um, who are trying to push out um, and promote indigenous Taiwanese food. So mm -hmm. there is a movement, growing movement and growing awareness here in Taiwan. But again, they um, constitute a very small part of our population as well. Mm -hmm. So this is just the, be the beginning of them trying to bring it out to the to the mainstream uh, with their food. Is that correct? I think it coincides with um, a lot of indigenous visibility all throughout the world, same in America. Um, again, they've right. been around for many years, but um, lately there has been like this movement, you know, with this rise of Taiwanese identity, with the indigenous people rising up and being like, yeah, we have our own unique cuisine as well. And there's actually a slow foods movement down in Taidong and they have a slow foods festival and a lot of the vendors are indigenous. So it's starting to become um, more visible. Um, but again, they've been here for longer than, you know, my family has um, been here. <laughs> right. Another thing that I, I want to note that a lot of people forget is that the first Chinese settlers who came to Taiwan in the 18th century, they were mostly men who came over. And they actually took indigenous women as wives, but then their heritage uh. names got wiped out. And so that history is completely lost or they got assimilated into Chinese culture. So huh. a lot of here in Taiwan, when you walk around, there is this indigenous ancestry, but no one can, it's hard to prove. And that culture and that connection has been completely lost. Huh. Are, are the languages, some of the languages, are they, do they still exist or, or have they disappeared? Yeah, some of them, especially in the East Coast, they still use it. Um, in places like Taipei and like Tainan, which are very developed, the wave cities, those tribes are virtually gone. Um, so that has disappeared. Again, each specific tribe has their own language and there is this movement mm. to revive it, but it's really difficult to make a living <laughs> doing that. And right. finding what about language. with their food? Are they trying to revive some of what um, the old food is? Or I mean, is anybody doing any research about that or not? Yeah, so in my book, I interviewed a woman named Alice, and she was the first mm -hmm. in her tribe to go to college. She's the daughter of a shaman, and I think her dad was like the chief of her tribe too. Um, and she's currently getting her PhD um, in Austronesian studies, and she's also a grandmother and a restaurateur. It's very versatile, and so she's oh one my of god trying to push her food out. Um, but again, like with all of these waves of colonization these people they don't exist in a bubble um their food has changed too you know they make dumplings but they'll put like indigenous herbs inside. so it's hard to say what's the original taiwanese food because so many generations have passed and they have also evolved food is constantly changing it's not this one step that's true yep yeah yep yeah i that's i i believe uh, the, the same way you're saying that food is a is a dynamic uh, culture it doesn't stand still uh, you know it keeps changing so yeah. uh yeah so okay so that's that's one part of the group that that's in taiwan i think you also talk about the hakka people um so what about their food what about hakka food is there any uh did they develop something special uh, you know special in taiwan yeah, so the Hakka people, when they came to Taiwan, they mostly settled um, in the hills. Um, and so there's, and it's also said, again, it's hard to confirm, but then they started, um, they started some of like the first pig raising operations here in Taiwan. Um, their cuisine is very distinct, but again, it's kind of all, it's hard to tell what's exactly Hakka. They use, in their cuisine, they use a lot of wild vegetables, um, a lot more salt, a lot of pickles. Um, I think one of the major pickle towns in Taiwan is a lot of Hakka people. Um, and uh, when I was interviewing a Hakka chef for my book, she was like, you know, um, people of Hokkien background will like plate things very beautifully. Like for example, here we have like cucumber, but she describes Hakka food as being much more rustic. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if I had to define like Hakka food a little bit, it would just be, um, yeah, more rustic, a lot more salt, <laughs> a lot more pickles, um, and a lot of wild vegetables um, as well. But um, yeah, Hakka people sort of exist because they were a migratory group. They traveled all throughout China. You guys have them in Singapore. Um, right. right. 
and their cuisines kind of um, shifts depending on where they are as well. Right, right. I, I, I'm in Singapore. Many of the Hakka cooking is actually very similar to to Fujian cooking. Yeah, uh, has a yeah has a lot of similarities there. So, uh, uh, but again, I mean, they are also very distinct. Just because uh, you know the similarity is only in some ingredients and preparation, but the, many of the actual technique and so on is a little bit different. So yeah, yeah. very subtle. And again, with Taiwan, because everyone just lives together. We haven't had major waves of immigration. It's really hard to immigrate to Taiwan. Like if you marry a Taiwanese person and you don't have Taiwanese like um, heritage, you cannot become a citizen unless you give up your nationality. So because we don't have these like waves of immigrants, our food has just kind of melded together into um, mm -hmm. Taiwanese cuisine. So I would describe that as being rather sweet. Um, and um more simpler and flavors you don't have these like distinct flavors like in america you know in america you have like a Sichuanese restaurant next to a vietnamese restaurant next to a thai restaurant next to like a mexican restaurant right like and you go to each right. restaurant all the flavors are completely different um in taiwan yeah you might have like a Yunnanese restaurant next to a Sichuan restaurant but like they all kind of taste similar you don't it's um because we don't have these like waves of immigration that really carve out these distinct cuisines. Right, right, right. Um, I have I have one question that I've always I've been always curious as to why is it that uh, sweet potato is such a big thing in Taiwan cooking? <laughs> do you do you did you do, do any research on that? Did you do you know yeah. why? Yeah. So um, when the first Chinese Chinese settlers came, they were kind of recruited over by the Dutch to work the land and when uh -huh. rice was grown it was really for a cash crop so it mm. would be sold to the Chinese mainland or sold to other places in the world and rice as you probably know is a very time intensive crop as well it's not something you can like put in the ground and like you can harvest it a week later a lot of cultivation involved um the sweet potato is something that grows like a weed you can literally put a sweet potato here on the ground in Taiwan and like they'll start popping up and like the leaves are completely <laughs> um, and it just grows so well. And so the older generation, that was their main carb of choice. Um, I think in my grandmother's generation, yeah, of course, rice was still around, but they would bulk it up with sweet potato. And right. um, my researcher, she was telling me a story about her grandmother who lived in the countryside of Taiwan. And when she was hungry, she would just dig up a sweet potato and then literally dig a hole in the ground put a bunch of dried leaves and twigs, light it on fire, throw the sweet potato in, cover the hole, and then in an hour, come back and dig the sweet potato up and eat it. Um, so it was just something that was born out of um, like necessity. Now the sweet potato right. is not indigenous to Taiwan. It came from South America, apparently right, by right. Uh, Portuguese traders. And I love that because again, I think a lot of people are like, oh, is this authentically Taiwanese? Is this has this been in Taiwan forever? But no, ingredients are constantly being introduced in the sweet potato. Absolutely. Yeah. Um and yeah, absolutely is in my parents' generation, um, you were either known as a sweet potato or a taro. Um, and you were a sweet potato if your family had come here 200 years ago with the Chinese immigration. And you were a taro <laughs> if you had come here with the Chinese refugees um, in the 20th century. And the nationalist you, your dad was government. A potato, and if your mom was a taro, you were known as a sweet potato taro. And that was kind of an offensive. <laughs> that also meant like half. So people are really adamant on these terms. Um, but now with my generation, we don't see people being called these names anymore. <laughs> well, that's funny. I've never, I don't, I've never heard. Uh, people talk like, uh, about the the sweet potato taro differences. <laughs> yeah, well, it's new to me. So it's like oa, which is sweet potato, and hanji, right. which is taro. So um, again, no no one really talks about it in this generation because all the kids who were born were born in Taiwan. But in my parents' generation, their parents' generation, those differences were more distinct, and there was a lot of discrimination depending on whether or not mm -hmm. you were. Mm -hmm. or... Right. Yeah. So um, let's see. I think it's time for us to actually maybe open up for some questions. Oh, um, 
let's uh, right. So uh, let's just go ahead and and open. Uh, uh, Neil, do do you know if there's any questions up there? Yeah, of course. Yeah, we have. Um, I think right now four questions. So I mean, you can still you know submit your questions. You know, um, either at the chat or Q and A. But the first question, you know, um, someone's asking, how is this? I think the Suanyi Bai Rou different from Kou Rou. Oh, no, is um, a braised pork belly um, in like a soy sauce braise and you braise it at such a low heat that the fat turns soft and like supple um, and depending on where you cook it sometimes they pair it with pickled vegetables um, but this isn't a braised um, pork this is poached and so the texture inherently is different here like the fat is chewy the skin is still the fat is still intact and the skin is chewy. Kozo literally melts in your mouth. Um, so those are the differences. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, Koro is yeah. a braise. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Um, and then, you know, another question, uh, you know, someone asking, cuisine varies um, a great deal in mainland China. How varied is the cuisine within Taiwan? Not as varied as mainland China because we're not as big as mainland China. Um, and when I was a kid going to Taiwan, we didn't have the high speed rail. So um, when we had to go to China, we had to take an airplane there and driving from Taipei to Tainan took forever. And I think back then the cuisine, there were more regional variants in cuisine. But now with the high speed rail, I can go down, I can hop on a train and be down in the South in a matter of two hours. And so there aren't as many regional varieties and differences. Um, again, and Taiwan is closed off to immigration. We haven't had a major wave of immigration um, since the 1950s. And so again, with these generations, our cuisine has kind of melded into our own um, thing, if you will. Whereas China is gigantic. Um, there are so many regional variants depending on where you are in the southeast, the north. People speak completely different languages and dialects that they sometimes don't even understand each other if you're in a if you go to a completely different part. So I honestly loved um, traveling through China because of that variation. Taiwan, um, we are a nation of 24 million people um, and our the landmass of Taiwan is about the state of Maryland. So because we're so small, you don't see as much variation um, compared to um, China. Great, thank you. Um, so next is more of a comment, um, you know, so um, this, you know, guest mentioned, I lived in Taipei for a year in 1968 and every restaurant specialized in a specific regional cuisine and the food was amazing. It was a full paradise. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm so jealous um, you don't have that. Oh, sorry, is there more to the comment? comment? No, 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 that was it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm so mm -hmm. jealous of that era because we don't have that anymore. So where I currently live in Taipei, I actually live in New Taipei City and this area is home to a lot of descendants of the immigrants who came over from China um, in the 1950s. So we have a lot of these like regional Chinese restaurants. So there are like Yunnanese places, um, Northern Chinese places. And I go in and it again, everything just tastes kind of Taiwanese. And I can kind of tell the difference because I've been traveling all over China and I'm from Los Angeles where we have regional Chinese food that tastes like what it does in China. And so, yeah, back then in the 60s and the 80s, Taiwan had such a rich diversity of regional Chinese cuisine. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of Fu Pei Mei, who was the, one of the most um, foremost um, TV show cooking hosts. Um, she was considered like the Julia Child of Chinese cookery. And she was here in Taiwan teaching the Chinese diaspora all over the world um, regional Chinese food. But again, that was a different generation and that cuisine, I have not been able to find that. Maybe there are a couple of old restaurants and I, again, will try to these restaurants, but over the years, our taste buds have um, changed and those restaurants don't exist in the same way anymore. It's kind of the equivalent of going to San Francisco or Los Angeles and trying to find, you know, like the, the restaurants that serve really good chop suey they're probably still there, but it's a little bit different um, nowadays. So food has changed um, since the 60s and it's fascinating 
to see how it has changed. Hmm. That's really very interesting because I've always thought that even now Taipei has as a good regional cooking and you're saying that uh, there there aren't any regional uh, Chinese restaurants anymore. Yeah, and believe me, I've tried. Like, I mean, <laughs> good Sichuanese um, food or Yunnan food. And I'm from LA where I think the San Gabriel Valley in Los Angeles, there are over 12 different provinces um, represented in at least one restaurant in LA. Um, and I've tried to sort of find similar flavors here in Taiwan, and I just can't find them. And it makes sense why, because we haven't in Los Angeles in the 2000s, there was a wave of immigrants from the Chinese mainland. These people were educated and wealthy, and they brought over chefs from the Chinese mainland to open the restaurants. And I know this because I interviewed these restaurateurs. Um, but in Taiwan, our last wave of chefs from the mainland came in the 50s and the 60s. Um, those people aren't really cooking anymore. And their children, um, even if they're cooking, they're not cooking the same thing. Right. So we don't have, if we had another wave um, from China, um, it would be a different story. But things haven't mm -hmm. changed. Yeah. I mean, like, I think that, that generation was the 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 generation that that created General Cho's chicken and uh, you know uh, I actually like... went to the restaurant that created the original General Cho's chicken um, a month ago here in Taipei and it was really interesting it's actually a lot um spicier interestingly enough than the General Cho's chicken in New York City um but when I went to this restaurant it was really weird it was like a wedding banquet venue and everyone there was just um, much older and it um was kind of dead um and I think people just go to it for like they'll host their weddings there and maybe people will have a business lunch but it was most definitely not a bustling place where your average Taiwanese people um would go to it felt kind of like stepping into like a retro um restaurant so right. I guess they're still here but they are not significant um and the average person does not go to them right Right, I guess, I guess that was the the cuisine of that era of the fifties and sixties, and 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 it was very different than what people are doing. It, I, I guess even in China, uh, original cooking in the fifties and sixties are probably very different than oh. the original cooking now. I, in fact, there probably wasn't any original cooking in the fifties and sixties <laughs> during yeah. the uh, you know all the cultural revolution and all that. Um, exactly. so and a lot of it is marketing so back then China was um, undergoing the cultural revolution so people saw and Taiwan was marketing itself as like the one China at that time too so that's why people saw Taipei as like another China or like um, right. place to experience Chinese culture language um, and food um, but in the 2000s when um so not the 2000s, in the 90s, when we transitioned to a democracy, that completely changed and people don't, again, we don't cook the same anymore. Right. Excellent. Oh, I know. I want to ask you about IE. Because <laughs> yeah. that IE is like an amazing thing for me because I the first time I tasted it, I was in Taipei and, and you know, it was uh, mixed in with those the uh, uh, coal um, sweet soup with the jelly and, you know, all sorts of stuff. And it was a mystery to me, whatever that is. And you you talk about this in your book, right? The IE. Yeah, so IE comes from the seeds of a fig. And figs, I'm sure a lot of you guys know, needs to be pollinated by a wasp. So this wasp is like endemic to Taiwan. And when um, you take the seeds, you literally just put the seeds in like a cloth, like a bag, a cheesecloth bag, and you put water in it. And it naturally will create a jelly by itself you don't have to like thicken it with anything and it's kind of a tasteless jelly there's a little bit of like a light maybe slightly sweet taste um but it's again kind of that qq texture that people love here right. and it's the flavoring that really makes it so people will flavor right, right. sweet lemon water um and uh -huh. 
Yeah, that's something you see a lot um, in the summer is when I go to the traditional markets here, you see like a giant block of IE next to like a giant block of grass jelly and you just tell them what you want and they'll cut it up. What you want, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can take it home or they'll make it into a drink for you in like a plastic bag. Um, So so, so IE is is an indigenous food, right? I mean, is it... Yeah, it's been naturalized here. So back in the day, the indigenous people actually, because these fig trees are really tall, so the indigenous men would climb these trees and scale them to harvest the figs, and then, you know, um, then they would process the seeds. But nowadays, there are actually farms that will grow the figs to a size that it's easily harvestable. Um, So yeah, it is an indigenous ingredient, but people here don't associate it as an indigenous ingredient. It's just something that is uh, very, very mainstream now. Right, right, because it's available everywhere now. So yeah, it has become mainstream. Uh, um, Is there any other questions? Uh, Yeah, yeah, actually we have some questions popping up. So, um, you know, so I guess it's asking, um, in your opinion, how did Taiwanese cuisine gain more interest in American food media and in American public? Yeah, so um, I really think New York City did a lot of great things for um, Taiwanese cuisine. Eddie Huang and the Guambal. I was actually in New York when this happened. Um, he, you know, was promoting the Guambal as this like Taiwanese hamburger. And people are like, oh, what is that? And I think it was in a very approachable um, dish. Um, another thing that I um, think really helped was um, boba. Boba has kind of become this like symbol of Asian American culture, not just Taiwanese, but it came from Taiwan. Um, and I think this really started to gain traction in the States in the 2010s, if you will, where people were like, oh, that's not a Chinese thing that's Taiwanese and it was Taiwanese Americans marketing it as the Taiwanese hamburger or Taiwanese beef noodle soup or Taiwanese boba and um back in those days it was very basic it wasn't like what's Taiwanese food people were still like oh Taiwanese food is a subset of um, Chinese food only in the last 10 five years I would say with geopolitical tensions being at an all-time high have more people been like okay we are not a subset of Chinese food. We are our own unique cuisine. And that has coincided with the rise of Taiwanese identity um, here in Taiwan. There's a, a chart that you can probably Google. It's by the National Tan Chi University in Taiwan, where they track the growing trends of Taiwanese identity. And um, I think the majority of people in Taiwan identify as just Taiwanese. And then this, after that, it's people who identify as both Chinese and Taiwanese. And then at the very bottom, I think 2% of people who are just like, oh, I'm only um, Chinese. But if you go back to that chart in 1992, um, it was completely opposite. Most people were like, oh, I'm Chinese. Maybe I'm Taiwanese. And very few people consider themselves as only Taiwanese. So I think this visibility has coincided with Taiwanese Americans kind of coming to terms with who they are. But also, unfortunately, because Taiwan is constantly in the news as a geopolitical flashpoint, um, a lot of people who write about culture, like myself, a lot of restaurateurs have had to kind of grapple with what it means um, to be someone who promotes Taiwanese food and what it means um, to our identity at large. Mm. All right. Well, thank you so, so is much. That, um, is that... Yeah. Um, is, is that geopolitical tension um, creating problem with with people? Um, you know, uh, in terms of in terms of um, uh, creating their own culinary culture or not? I mean, is there is there is there, is there, exactly. is there any tension like say saying that oh this is this is from mainland China and this is this is not something that I want to embrace or or is there is there any no. kind of pushback like that? No, it's not um, exclusive in that sense, but I do see as geopolitical tensions become more intense, people here become more Taiwanese or they find ways to make themselves different. But you don't see people being like, oh, I'm not going to use this on peppercorns because they come from China. It's not like that at all. Again, okay. um, people are very aware, and I, as I am I, that Chinese culture and cuisine is an inherent part of us. But 
I think what people are doing is trying to find ways that we are different and we are unique and embracing that because what the Chinese government does occasionally is uses Chinese culture as a way to claim us as their own. Um, a couple months ago, there was a, actually a year ago, there was a tweet by like a Chinese state spokesperson where they were like, Taiwan has like 12, Taipei has like 12 Sandong restaurants. Um, therefore, Taipei is part of China, the long lost child. <laughs> then all the trolls were like, hey, uh, China has a bunch of KFCs. China is a part of America or Kentucky. Um, the long lost child will come home. But this is the thing um, that the Chinese government uses as the fact that we right. have Chinese heritage as a way to claim us. And then um, on the flip side, what Taiwanese people do is we try to find ways that we are different. And it's not just food. You see it through music, through art. Um, and it's the uh -huh. pushback to this um, homogenization of what it means to be ethnically Chinese. Right. Right. OK. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, yeah, someone, I mean, we'd have a yeah, few more questions. Yeah. Um, and then, um, so the next question, so someone's asking, what's the biggest food trend right now in Taiwan? Food trend? So, I mean, uh, again, I didn't put this in my book because what is, things are always happening, weird things are always happening in Taiwan. There's this love for Western brunch in Taiwan. So if you go out on like Sundays, like the most, packed restaurants are always the brunches and it's kind of weird because it never tastes as good as brunch in America um and then people also love putting like truffles on everything um the one that always makes the news is like pizza hut they always do insane trends um I think yesterday they launched a ninja turtle pizza it looks insane it's like a 2d flat turtle or they'll put like blood cake um, and like sausage, Taiwanese sausages or mochi or boba on pizza. Um, so there's a lot of like shock factor here in Taiwan because social media kind of um, works like that. But on a much more like high level note, uh, what's really cool is that you see um, fine dining chefs sort of embracing um, Taiwanese produce and uh, Taiwanese ingredients. Um, I think in the past, the fine dining restaurants that never got paid attention to, they were, you know, making Cantonese, high-end Cantonese food or high-end Japanese food. Or, um, But now, I think this year was the first time a uh, fine dining restaurant that specialized in just in Taiwanese cuisine. They got three Michelin stars, which is like the first time in like Taiwan's culinary fine dining history. So you do see that trend as well. Um, but yeah, I think... Like in terms of trends, a lot of things are very gimmicky here in Taiwan because it's the same in the States. Whatever um, looks good on social media um, is what sells. You talk about, you, you, you just mentioned um, Japanese uh, influences and that has a lot of influence in ta Taiwanese cooking, right? I mean, because uh, for during the, the 50 years occupation of Taiwan by the Japanese, they really... Uh, push a lot of the culture into uh, the Taiwan uh, people. And so is, so is food greatly influenced by that? So the way our soy sauce, rice wine, vinegar, um, our core condiments, the way they are made are made with Japanese era of recipes. Mm. So um, again, like the way to make soy sauce is very complicated. I won't go into the nuances, but I basically called up like this company, Jinlan, and I was like, okay, so you guys make your soy sauce with uh, toasted wheat, not wheat flour. Um, and I just kind of listed down all these criteria. And I was like, but isn't that more similar to what they do in Japan? And they're like, yeah, of course. We were like, we were established during the Japanese colonial era. And then all of these like bells came up in my head. I was like, wait, this is true for all of our condiments. The way that these formulations are made, we're made with Japanese era recipes. It's not to say that these condiments are Japanese. Over the years, we've infused our own techniques and um, different method methods inside. But um, yeah, the Japanese influence is super strong as well. And um, most people joke like when they go out to eat, 
I think a lot of people will just go eat at Japanese restaurants or Japanese izakayas, but even like the izakayas here in Taiwan have like a uniquely Taiwanese spin as well. So there's this huge love for Japanese culture, but you also see the influence at the very foundational levels of our food. Hmm. That actually, that's really interesting. I didn't realize that the, the Taiwanese soy sauce were made with the Japanese method. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Um, black vinegar. So in China, black vinegar is um, aged vinegar, and through the Maillard reaction, it eventually becomes black. It's aged in these vats. In Taiwan, it's actually just plain rice vinegar, and then they steep it with fruits and um, vegetables, and it's actually quite sweet. And um, it's similar to the way it's made is much more similar to Worcester sauce than it is to vinegar. And when I was like looking into the history of it, it was like um, they got this technique from the Japanese because the Japanese have their version of like Worcester sauce. So mm -hmm. Taiwanese mm -hmm. vinegar is Japanese Worcester sauce, which is, again, like a very weird thing to think about. But um <laughs> But then again, if you like Google this in English, people think they're the same thing, that Taiwanese black vinegar is the same thing as like um, Tsukan vinegar in China. But if you taste it, they're fundamentally different um, because they're not hmm. made. Hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we still have yeah, a few more questions, but um, but yeah, but well, actually the next one is actually about, I think probably cooking the suan li bai rou. So um, yeah, so this person asking, how long do you cook the pork belly once you turn off the heat? Yeah, so you turn off the heat and you leave it in there for 30 minutes. Um, and then that's basically it. And then you rinse it off in cold water to make sure it stops cooking. But this way, cooking it with the residual heat ensures that it's super tender. And they use this same technique when people are cooking like Hainan chicken or poached chicken. Um, you bring it to a boil, you simmer it only for like a couple of um, minutes, five to 10 minutes, and then you let the residual heat cook it. Um, you can also use a thermometer to just make sure it's cooked through. Um, the temperature is in my cookbook, but um, according to my recipe, it's one pound of meat, simmer for, uh, bring to a boil, simmer for five minutes, and then let the residual heat cook it for um, 30 minutes and have the uh, lid on at all times. Great, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, um, and someone is yeah, asking that... which recipe, yeah, in the book, has your favorite story behind it? Oh, there's so many. Um, actually, this sounds stereotypical, but I really like the beef noodle soup recipe because I got that recipe from the man who has won the beef noodle soup championship the most amount of times. I think he's won it five times. Um, and he is a restaurateur here in Taiwan. And this is the recipe he gives to his students. So what he does is he trains aspiring beef noodle soup restaurateurs on how to make beef noodle soup. So this isn't the recipe he uses at his restaurants, but it's the base recipe he gives to his students. And I really like it because I think it represents how Taiwanese people see beef noodle soup now. I think a lot of Taiwanese Americans and Asian Americans, they expect a beef noodle soup to be really intense, heavy on the jiang, heavy on the spices, very like hong sao, like aromatic. And that was a version that was really popular um, back in the day because beef was very low quality here in Taiwan. And so you needed the spices to mask the flavor of the beef. Um, but now <laughs> people who have beef noodle soup restaurants, they get their beef from America or Australia and really high cuts of beef. And so you don't want to mask that flavor. You want to let that flavor shine through. So I like his recipe because it has those like spices as well, but they're really just kind of like an underlining note. It doesn't overpower the beef. And so, yeah, you guys can try it out. I really think um, his version is what I call like modern um, beef noodle soup. And nowadays, if you go to any beef noodle soup and rest, um, restaurant in Taipei, you have like the home style version with all the spices, but you can also get beef noodle soup with clear broth without any of those spices. And I mm. think it's actually what a lot of people here in Taiwan prefer because you just want to taste the 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 good quality of beef now. So again, another example of how food has sort of changed here in modern Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, the clear broth is sort of similar to pho in Vietnamese uh, yeah, beef yeah. noodles. Uh, we don't use the rice noodles, but yeah, it is. Um, right, right. But uh, the broth is, is clear and 
and still has the aromatics like spices and so on, but but it doesn't have the soy sauce, the dark topanjang. Uh, exactly. uh, yeah. Stronger than the yeah. chili. Also, like right. the way the chili paste here is made is very different from Sutan as well. I actually prefer the Sutan one because I find it much more nuanced. The Taiwanese one is just very, very sweet, which again is a common theme um, in our food. Okay. Um, is there any more questions? Yeah, we'll have to only yeah, yeah, a few more. So the sorry, like but there I think they're pretty like short questions. So um so the next one will be how would you categorize the food in the night markets in the larger cities in Taiwan? In the what? The night markets in the what cities? Oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, yeah, I think you just it's so like, how would you categorize? Basically, I think someone's asking, how would you categorize the food in the night markets uh, in Taiwan? Yeah, this night market. Yeah, so um, night market food has changed a lot over the years. Uh, when I was a kid, it was, you know, vendors who had been doing it for multiple generations. And it's always kind of been the same, just much more greasy. You'll have like your deep fried chicken breast with like this. A grilled sausage um you'll have like a grilled squid with like the saute sauce um but nowadays you still have these rest um vendors but the difference is um all the dishes for the wet markets uh sorry the night markets are actually prepped in a central kitchen um during the day and then they ship it out with their employees to like a bunch of night markets all over taipei so unfortunately, I think a lot of that like gritty spirit um, that I grew up with has been lost. Or you'll have like young people trying to like innovate their new flavors. So you'll have like a corn dog stuffed with like spicy cheese or like Korean fried chicken. Um, but it's just the economics of it all. It really doesn't make sense for people to just be flinging out the same dish for generations, especially here in Taipei, because real estate is so expensive and um, cost of living um, compared to the average salary um, is so expensive. There are a couple of night markets that still like that I really love that still have these multi-generation vendors and one of them is Ningxia Night Market, N-I-N-G-X-I-A. Um, that one I think around 80% of the vendors are still you know family owned. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, I would say night market food, it's something you should be able to hold as you're walking around, um, greasy, um, punchy with a lot of sauce. Um, but the, the scene has really changed. Um, it's interesting when a lot of journalists come to Taiwan and they want to interview me, they always ask me to take them to a night market. But I always try to push back because if you go to a night market, the, yeah, most people who are there, they're tourists. It's not Taiwanese people. What Taiwanese people do is we go to a place called Zetao, which means um, like a hot, and it's, it's a hot, noisy, stir fry restaurant that's semi outdoors. And there you get like just plat. This is a dish, you know, from the Zetao restaurant. And the chef will whip up, you know, um, like stinky tofu or like um, fried noodles or a whole fish. And um, there are women who serve beers because they're helping, they're promoting their like beer company. And that's, I think, where like the late night food really comes alive and where the average Taiwanese um, person goes. So yeah, there's a whole chapter on Zotal, um in my book as well. But I think that energy of late night eating has really shifted um, from the night market to the Zotal, um restaurant. Great, thank you. Um, and the next question is, are there like fat diets, kind of, you know, like popular diets in Taiwan, like America, for example, keto diet, gluten-free diet, etc.? No, <laughs> there is a big vegetarianism scene, um, but that's because we have a lot of people who are Buddhists and Taoists. So um, some of my favorite restaurants in Taipei are vegetarian. There is this place called Chao, C-H-A-O, that is literally a vegetarian zetal restaurant. So you'll have like this dish, but instead of pork, they'll make it with like tofu. And for some reason it tastes like just as good, if not even better than, than the meat version. And um, we have like cafeteria canteens where you can get, you know, protein, rice, vegetables, and everything is vegetarian or even banquet restaurants that's just vegetarian food. The only difference between Taiwanese slash Chinese vegetarian food is that they don't have the alien vegetables, meaning they don't do garlic, um, onions, um, scallions, because those um, those ingredients are believed to in, um, 
like awaken the senses, awaken the passions and you don't want that. So it's kind of like a religious thing. Um, but vegetarian food is so diverse here in Taiwan. I have a lot of vegan friends who come to Taiwan and they just like eat their way through because we have so many options in that regard. Um, but most people like they, I don't see a big keto gluten free um, diet here in Taiwan. It's not very common. Um, in East Asia yet. Who knows what will happen in the future. Yeah, thank you. Um, someone, you know, would love for you to just quickly talk about how Taiwanese bread and pastry culture evolved to today's countless bakeries. Um, you know, it's like so interesting given that Taiwanese kitchen don't typically have ovens. Yeah, oh my gosh, I love this topic. I can go on for hours about it, but long story short is um, Taiwan, we are a subtropical island. We do not grow wheat at all. And back then, like, if you think of like guan bao or um, dan zai mian, these very traditional Taiwanese dishes, those were only served in small quantities and for special occasions, or you only had like a bowl that was this big. And wheat really was not introduced en masse until the Cold War. The United States during the Eisenhower administration had a program called Food for Peace where they offloaded thousands of pounds of wheat um, to countries like Vietnam, um, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. And it was actually a soft power initiative to um, convince these countries not to go communist, um, which I think is really fascinating. And so all of a sudden we had all this wheat, but like the average Chinese person had no idea what to do with it. And so there were these marketing campaigns that were launched. Bakers were sent to America to learn how to bake cakes. Um, there were these problematic slogans that linked wheat to having a taller frame, that it made you smarter, um, that it was more nutritious for you. And this wasn't just in Taiwan. This was happening in Korea and um, Japan. Apparently, the, the banh mi baguette was really spurred on um, by this influx of wheat in Vietnam as well. Again, these countries do not traditionally produce wheat. Um, and the people who knew how to make wheat were the refugees from northern China who had come in around this time. And that's when those like Chinese bake, uh, Chinese breakfast place started. So I'm sure a lot of you guys associate Taiwanese breakfast with yo, yo tiao, sao bing, you know, the fried dough coolers. That is a tradition um, from northern China. And then at the same time, Japan started these like bakeries, um, baking lots of western style breads but they put their own infusion on it they use a thing called in japan they call it yudan and in taiwan we call it tangzong um and that's um it's in the book it's basically a, a slurry that you will mix into the bread so it becomes um fluffy um hence milk bread right and that just kind of became our default bread um, and all of these bakeries started popping up because, again, we had so much wheat, we didn't know what to do with it. And today, these Asian bakeries are such a cornerstone in um, Taipei life. Um, my mom, you know, she doesn't really go out. She doesn't cook when she's here in Taipei. She just, like, buys a bunch of Asian bread. And then they make bread to order every single day. Um, but the bread is very distinctly Asian in the sense that it's sweet um, and you will just they have like pork floss and scallions on top. But that really was an initiative started in the Cold War and actually influenced a lot by America. So I love that piece of history because I think people are like, why are people eating so much bread here? But it's a completely different style than what we're used to um, in the Western world. Hmm. Yeah, wow, I think so Tangtong is a Japanese yeah. um, creation, I think, right? I mean, it, it originated in Japan. I think that's, that's the day... Uh, they're the one that started it. Yeah, it's really hard to find the exact um, the origins of it. I interviewed a woman, Yvonne Chen. If you go really deep into like the bread making scene, everyone credits this Taiwanese woman, Yvonne Chen, as the person who started the milk bread. But I actually tracked her down and interviewed her. And she was like, the tangzong, that technique was something that was taught to her in baking school in Taiwan. And it was something, yeah, that the Japanese um, brought over here in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So she says it came um, from Japan. But that technique, again, of using scalding hot water or um, a hot element in bread um, has been in Asian Chinese cookery for a long time. You do that for scallion pancakes, you do that for dumplings, and it just makes the dough that much more supple and soft. 
Um, but I think what happened was the Japanese, they took it to another level as they do with a lot of things and um, sort of codified it and incorporated it into their pastries. And, and now it's just commonly used all throughout East and Southeast Asia. Asia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, it's all over Asia. Yeah. Everybody used the same. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're down to just the last two questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was so such a fascinating <laughs> history. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, the next sorry, the um yeah, the next, you know, the last two questions, the you know, the last will be the um a food and cooking show speak on television in Taiwan. No, um, I also don't have a TV here, so I wouldn't know. But I think again, like the iconic person um was Fu Pei Mei back in the day. If anything, again, like I don't feel like most people watch have like a physical television you I, I am on like social media and you see um food influencers who do cooking and a big one his name is like chef james um but what they'll do again it's not like no one's really doing like traditional old school taiwanese food um what they'll do is they'll it's kind of like the states will do like quick weekday meals that you can like whip up um, or they'll do like western food because that's exotic here um, but we don't really have the same, there's not that like strong personality of like Fu Pei Mei as there was. And it's not like the states where there are these like big food influencers. Um, I mean, I'm sure there are, but I don't necessarily know of them. And if anything, they're on social what media, about, on like the television. Um, what about Ah I think he was, he was, he's big, right? The, in Taiwan. Who? Ah uh, um uh he he has a, a cooking show i think in taiwan um yeah again i i have no idea. i don't have a tv so i don't <laughs> you know what's like trendy and it's funny because people are always asking me like what's the top new restaurants like who's like hip and like new in taiwan like we just cook at home like this is our menu board that we like write and i just stay at home most of the time and my book was more of like a historical research not um, finding what's like new and hip. Right. Um, right. So I'm not the person to ask for that. <laughs> All right. Well, I think the last question is a perfect way to actually get yeah, to wrap up the conversation. So, um, yeah, you know, someone's asking, do you have any upcoming book signing plans in the US, um, you know, um, especially in New York City or just, you know, like, or even just, you know, what, what's next? Yeah. yeah, no, I don't. So um, something that I haven't really talked about, but um, I had a baby at the same time my book came out, so I wasn't able to do a physical book tour. Um, but what has been really interesting is that there are a lot of journalists who come to Taiwan all the time because of the tension. We just had a presidential election, so I am still doing a lot of, um, yeah, interviews and press events here in Taiwan. But if I'm ever in the States again, I'd love to do more events. Um, but so far, things have just been in Taiwan and taking care of a newborn. Um, but yeah, apparently books sell just as well virtually as they do in person. So I don't think I'm missing out <laughs> on that much. Yeah. So, I mean, I have to say that I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at the information that you put into the book. It's not just a recipe book. It's, it's really a, a, a history of Taiwanese food and the, uh, and the uh, evolution of it and, and how it came about to be, uh, you know, the modern Taiwanese cooking. And it's it's an amazing book. I really have to say that I'm, I, I enjoyed reading it. It's really been lots of fun reading it. Yeah, thank you. And what's been really cool about this book is that I think most people hear about it through word of mouth. Um, Cause I don't, I'm not super active on social media anymore. And um, it's just really, encouraging to see how there is this enthusiasm for Taiwanese cuisine and the history and the culture behind it and I hope there will be more books like that where people really investigate food origins and food history um, because there clearly is an interest um, in that. Definitely. Well, thank you Clarissa. This has been such a wonderful uh, discussion and and Neil, uh, you want to close this up? Yeah, well, just, you know, once again, you know, thank you so much for, um, you know, yeah, um, Carissa and Kian, you know, for this wonderful um, event. Um, you know, as mentioned, um, if you have any additional questions or feedback, feel free to, you know, um, 
email us at info at mockernyc.org. You know, the event will also be available um, for on-demand viewings at our YouTube channel. And of course, if you would like to purchase a copy of, you know, um, Made in Taiwan, you can check out, you know, um, Clarissa's website, um, you know, and if you are in the New York city area, you know, feel free to, you know, visit um, this general store called Yunhai Yanxue, where they actually do have uh, autographed copies of um, Clarissa's book. So, you know, and then, of course, along with other, you know, the condiments, you know, um, sauces, and even, you know, other cookbooks. So it's located in Brooklyn, you know, I already put it in the chat, but, uh, but also I think they do, um, shipping as well. So feel free to, you know, check it out. Um, yeah. And then of course, you know, support us. And then um, just a quick plug, you know, check out our website for our upcoming programs, you know, have various programs, you know, in the coming weeks, um, you know, especially in um, April, we have a um, goal workshop, we have a mocha talks about Anna Mei Wang, and then even also have a full lineup of um, for our AEPI Heritage Month programming. Um, and then as, you know, we mentioned about, um, that um, famous Taiwanese also. So Kian and I are actually working on um, a program um, about, you know, um, full pay May. And then since there's a upcoming book, um, you know, will be will come out in a few weeks. So you know, we so if, if you follow us, you know, you can um, actually be able to you know learn more about it. So once again, thank you so much um, for tonight for joining us. Yeah, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.